In The Emperor's New Clothes, I write about five different matters. A unifying theme is the presence of hypocrisy and hubris by those in positions of authority, and the challenge of overcoming unwarranted secrecy to achieve some measure of accountability. Welcome to the Miller Center Forum. I'm George Gillum, chair of the forum. Our guest today is Richard Benveniste. Uh, Richard is a graduate of Columbia Law School who got his master's in law from Northwestern. Uh, immediately after finishing his formal education, he became an assistant United States attorney for the Southern District of New York. Uh, there, he caught the attention of the uh, Watergate uh, Task Force, and he uh, was hired by Archibald Cox to work as chief of the Watergate Task Force, and then later as special outside counsel to the Senate Committee on Government Operations that was continuing the, the work on Watergate. Uh, he worked for both Archibald Cox and Leon Jaworski uh, during that very difficult time. But that did not end uh, Richard Benveniste's public service. Uh, he worked uh, as a private practice lawyer, but uh, like so many in Washington, he was able to jump in and, and help the government at, at critical times. Uh, he worked uh, as the minority counsel for the Senate Watergate, the Whitewater Committee. Uh, then he served as one of the members of the 9-11 Commission. Uh, he's now engaged in the private practice of law with uh, Mayor Brown uh, in D.C. And most recently, uh, in fact this week, as part of a panel that reported to the Secretary of Homeland Security on recommended changes in the color-coded alert system. Um, in addition to depriving Jay Leno and David Letterman of uh, one of their favorite punchlines, um, I think it'll be interesting to have him explain exactly what it is they've done. Uh, much of his fascinating career is covered in his new book, The Emperor's New Clothes, Exposing the Truth from Watergate to 9-11. Uh, we will follow the forum with a book signing uh, at a new location out front, and we uh, look forward to uh, having you have the opportunity uh, to buy the book and have Richard sign it. Please welcome Richard Benveniste. <laughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much, George. And I, uh, I want to thank Governor Belisles uh, for hosting my wife Donna and me last evening in a, in a lovely and lively dinner uh, here uh, in Charlottesville. Uh, I'd also like to recognize my dear friend Mort Kaplan, um, who I think had the original idea for me being invited here to, uh, and uh, in a uh, random uh, street encounter, as so often happens in Washington among old friends. In The Emperor's New Clothes, I write about five different matters that I've been involved in, one in each decade from the late 19. 60s to the present involving the intersection of law and politics. A unifying theme is the presence of hypocrisy and hubris in varying degrees by those in positions of authority and the challenge of overcoming unwarranted secrecy to achieve some measure of accountability. I am very much the product of the New York public school system, where we learned in the aftermath of World War II the values and ideals America stood for and how the world looked up to us. My mother, who had a difficult childhood as a foster child from the age of five, instilled in me the appreciation for fairness, for rooting for the underdog. I was a Brooklyn Dodgers fan. <laughs> and the importance of standing up to bullies. It was my incredible good fortune, as George mentioned, 
to be hired for my first job as a lawyer by Robert M. Morgenthau, the legendary United States attorney at the time and for the last three decades, the district attorney of New York County, and to be surrounded by colleagues who mentored me and taught me by their example the proper boundaries of the exercise of prosecutorial power. Initially, I gravitated toward the prosecution of organized crime and labor racketeering cases. Now, this could be very heady stuff for a young lawyer only 25 years of age. Indeed, I remember how full of myself I was the first time my picture appeared in a New York tabloid. That evening, my cousin Stan from Brooklyn phoned me and said, hey, I saw your picture in the Daily News today. And I began to pontificate on what an interesting case it was, this mafia guy. And he interrupted me, and Stan said, yeah, I was riding on the subway, and I looked down, and I was standing on your face. <laughs> now, for me, this was an epiphany. <laughs> you know, the press can be fickle. One day, you're up. The next day, not so much. The important thing is to conduct yourself in a professional way and, and perform your responsibilities, but also not to take myself too seriously and to have a sense of humor. And I hope this book uh, reflects uh, both of those characteristics. Bob Morgenthau's only marching order was to do the right thing. He put action behind his words when he authorized his assistants to investigate an influence peddling ring run by a New York lawyer by the name of Nathan Veloshin out of the office of the Democratic Speaker of the House, John W. McCormack, the most powerful legislator in Morgenthau's own political party. A chapter of my book deals with my involvement with that investigation, first as the most junior assistant assigned to it, and finally as the chief prosecutor in the case against John McCormick's administrative assistant, Martin Swig, who ultimately was convicted of perjury and bribery. Incredibly, Veloshin, this New York lawyer and longtime friend of McCormack, spent three days a week installed behind the desk of the speaker's district office, running his business uh, with the uh, full assistance of the speaker's staff uh, to benefit a long list of his clients from convicted mafiosi, and stock swindlers, corporate executives with SEC problems. Uh, we found that uh, three days a week, Voloshin took the early shuttle from New York to Washington, was met at the airport by the speaker's limousine, and whisked to the speaker's office in the Rayburn building. What got my particular attention was how young men were able to avoid military service. This was during the Vietnam War and were able to get bogus hardship discharges from the military on the basis of fees paid to Voloshin and the exertion of political pressure from the Speaker's office. This despite the fact that the Speaker was a hardline supporter of the Vietnam War. The hypocrisy and hubris of political figures violating the public trust has held an enduring fascination for me. Clearly, the emperor's new clothes, Hans Christian Andersen's iconic tale of hubris, chicanery, and groupthink made an indelible impression on me as a child. In my fifth year at the United States Attorney's Office, I was invited to travel to Washington to interview with Archibald Cox, the newly installed Watergate Special Prosecutor. And here I think I'll read a bit from my first meeting with Archie Cox. 
Archibald Cox had a reputation as a stern and forbidding legal scholar, self-righteous and unyielding. His roots and background were about as different from mine as anything I could imagine. My interview lasted 15 minutes. Professor Cox's appearance, tall, ramrod straight, with close-cropped steel gray hair and clear blue eyes, was anything but suggestive of any connection between us. The starkness of his office, freshly painted white and unadorned with anything on the walls to personalize it, was of a piece with his unfashionable gray suit and drab narrow necktie. By contrast, I wore my hair longish in the contemporary style of the early 1970s, particularly unflattering in my case, <laughs> given its tendency to frizz up at the slightest mention of humidity. Summer in the reclaimed swamp that is our nation's capital is synonymous with humidity. I was wearing a wide paisley tie, <laughs> equally contemporary and an equally unfortunate fashion statement given the benefit of hindsight. Photographs of me from this period evoke spontaneous gales of laughter from my two daughters. If my appearance was disconcerting to Professor Cox, he gave no indication of it. And indeed, notwithstanding uh, all of that, uh, Professor Cox hired me and I, became, I began my association with uh, Jim Neal, Jill, Jill uh, Wine Volner, Stephen and Chuck Breyer, and dozens of extraordinary lawyers who were my colleagues on uh, Archie's staff and my friends uh, for the decades since. It was only mildly surprising then, having recently prosecuted the Democratic Speaker's administrative assistant, John McCormick, uh, decided he would not run for re-election in view of that scandal. I was now among, in, included among the partisan Eastern elite out to get Nixon, according to the Nixon White House spin machine. Notwithstanding his great intellect and political acumen, Nixon's imperial view of the presidency and his personal insecurities worked to encourage a competition among his lieutenants to cater to his dark side, disregarding legal boundaries to strike at and punish his adversaries and critics. From the Watergate chapter, I'll read about first listening to the subpoenaed March 21, 1973, Cancer on the Presidency conversation between John Dean and Richard Nixon, and later joined by Nixon's chief of staff, H.R. Haldeman. Recall that the outpouring of protest and revulsion against Nixon's firing of Cox, which of course resulted in the resignations of Attorney General Richardson and Deputy Attorney General Ruckelshaus uh, caused Nixon to reverse field and make the tapes available. Very few people at the White House were privy to the information uh, that we were now listening to on these tapes. Nixon, the obstruction of justice I feel could be cut off at the pass. I wonder if the payments don't have to continue. Let me put it this way. Let's suppose that you, you get the million bucks. Dean had told him it was going to cost a million dollars to continue these payments over time. And you get the proper way to handle it. And you could hold that side. It would seem to me that would be worthwhile. Don't you, just looking at the immediate problem, don't you have to handle Hunt's financial situation damn soon? It seems to me we have to keep the cap on the bottle that much. Otherwise, we won't have any options. Either that or it all blows right now. Bob Haldeman walked in to join the conversation. Nixon, praising Dean for containing the damage, summarized Dean's report. First, you've got it, the Hunt problem. That ought to be handled right now. And again, you've got no choice with Hunt. You better damn well get that done. We sat back in utter disbelief. The March 21 tape went far beyond anything we had imagined. 
Dean's earnest effort to push the president out of harm's way by ending the cover-up and accepting personal responsibility for his role had been rejected by his president in favor of continuing the conspiracy and paying Hunt immediately. The implications of this tape were stupendous. Hunt had not yet been paid. We went back and forth, rewinding the tape, listening to selected passages. Nixon was more than a passive cheerleader for the cover-up. In his instruction to Dean to continue the payments to Hunt, which came a day before the delivery of a substantial cash payment to Hunt, this provided per powerful evidence of Nixon's active participation in a felony. The third event about which I write is Abscan, um, the investigation in trial, uh, which I lost, incidentally, so I'm not going to spend much time on that. <laughs> I was representing a Philadelphia lawyer who became an unwilling adjunct to what I believed was a dangerously unsupervised sting operation in which a career criminal named Mel Weinberg, supposedly the agent of a fabulously wealthy and eccentric Arab oil sheikh, essentially ran the show, skewing the investigative premise and running rings around his FBI handlers. In my view, allowing the FBI to conduct an honesty test on congressmen and senators without any predicate evidence showing their intention to uh, engage in illegal conduct gave excessive and unhealthy power to the executive branch. In fact, any public official who accepted money was convicted and went to jail. The power of what appeared on videotape trumped any explanation of behind-the-scenes stage managing and manipulation. Which brings me to Whitewater. I think the passage of more than a decade provides us with a bit more perspective on how truly insubstantial were the myriad of allegations that comprised Whitewater. As minority counsel to the Senate uh, Democrats on the Whitewater Committee, I observed that the media was neither pro-Democrat nor pro-Republican, pro-liberal or pro-conservative but unquestionably, and largely uncritically, pro-scandal. <laughs> the greatest benefit of this assignment was being able to work with the ranking minority member of the Watergate Committee, Paul Sarbanes, and a very talented staff who did all the work. Alphonse D'Amato was the chairman, and Michael Chernoff, recently our Homeland Security Secretary, uh, was my opposite number as the majority counsel. And uh, here I'd like to recognize Bud Moss, who is here with us today. Um, Senator Sarbanes, a former administrative assistant and a good friend. So I'll read a little bit about Paul Sarbanes. Sarbanes' parents came from Laconia in Greece, from which the adjective laconic is derived. And true to his heritage, Paul could be defined by a certain economy of movement and speech. But when Sarbanes spoke, his peers in the Senate listened. He was also known as one of the Senate's best thinkers. Indeed, from time to time, when I would raise some point or other, Paul would say to me, let me think about that. He would then proceed to think quietly while I stood by, waiting for the thinking portion of our interaction to segue back to actual conversation. <laughs> for me, this was a new experience. As a trial lawyer, I was accustomed to thinking on my feet and making quick decisions. Paul was just the opposite. One evening, our legal team was in the Bat Cave, which our nickname for the subterranean offices the minority got. The, uh, the majority staff was in the penthouse. Um, and we were reviewing a transcript of a particular witness's testimony. There was a difference of opinion as to whether the stenographic transcript was accurate or had admitted something important the witness had said. 
And since all the hearings were televised by C-SPAN, we were able to verify whether the transcript was accurate. So as we fast forwarded the videotape looking for the point in the testimony in question, we laughed at how goofy everybody looked with their eyes blinking madly and their heads moving in, in herky-jerky fashion, except Senator Sarbanes, who looked about the same as when we viewed the proceedings at normal speed. <laughs> I had occasion to mention this phenomenon to Paul as I implored him to take immediate action to counter one of the many gambits D'Amato and company had come up with. I argued that unless we acted quickly, the window of opportunity to put forward a counterpoint would slam shut. Unconvinced, Paul drew upon his vast storehouse of classical literature to respond, Richard, in the fable of the tortoise and the hare. Who did you identify with? <laughs> Finally, the 9-11 Commission. As one of 10 members of an extraordinary commission, I operated under the simple proposition that the commission existed to find out why we were unable to prevent the attack and based on the facts we found to make recommendations to fix the problems and avoid repetition. The skill set I brought to this assignment was the ability to ask questions, to listen to answers, and to continue to ask questions until I got real answers. Again, we had an outstanding staff that did the heavy lifting and the sifting of an incredible volume of material preparing for hearings with extensive staff statements and drafting a final report. Tom Kane and Lee Hamilton worked tirelessly, hand in glove, to prove wrong the pundits who predicted that the commission would soon dissolve into a partisan food fight. While we didn't always agree, I came away with enormous respect for my colleagues on the commission for keeping their eye on the ball, despite the many challenges we faced. At the end of the day, we were largely able to put aside our partisan impulses and agree on a comprehensive final report and extensive set of recommendations without a single dissenting opinion. The power of unanimity was critical to achieving public support. And indeed, Congress has enacted virtually all of the Commission's recommendations into law except, of course, our recommendations for Congress to reform itself in the way uh, to streamline uh, and consolidating the oversight responsibility over intelligence and homeland security. So the 9-11 chapter of my book focuses uh, exclusively on the inquiry we conducted and, from my point of view, how we were able to compile a factual record, sometimes using the equivalent of a blowtorch and pliers to extract relevant information. Among the areas I discuss are debunking the notion that no one could have anticipated that terrorists could attack us using hijacked commercial aircraft as flying bombs. Our initial debate with, within the Commission about whether or not to hold open fact-based hearings disproving the White House statement that a credible threat was made against Air Force One by an anonymous caller on 9-11. That never happened. Unraveling the timeline as to whether President Bush gave the Vice President authorization to shoot down uh, commercial airplanes before Dick Cheney passed such an order onto the military issuing a report, and perhaps this, uh, in my view, this was our, our signal achievement among the conclusions of fact that we reached, that the administration claims that Iraq and Saddam were behind the 9-11 attacks by al-Qaeda were not supported by the evidence. Interestingly, it was not until five years after we issued our report that Dick Cheney was to admit that there was no connection between Saddam and Iraq in the 9-11 attack. 
that happened earlier this summer. This, for the first time after a concerted campaign begun seven years ago to conflate the Iraqi invasion with the 9-11 attacks, such that at one point, 70% of all Americans, according to the polls, believed that Saddam was responsible for 9-11. I talked about how the commission was misled by the administration and the CIA as to the full reasons for denying us access, direct access to the detainees. Never, ever uh, did I suspect that the detainees were being subjected to torture. The genesis of Bill Clinton's classified memorandum of notification authorizing the CIA to capture or kill Osama bin Laden. How the commission dealt with Attorney General Ashcroft's attack on our colleague Jamie Gorelick for supposedly creating the wall between domestic and foreign intelligence gathering, despite the fact that this wall was in place for many years before President Clinton took office, and how that unfair attack on our most popular member unified the commission. As we said at the time, a man setting out to attack a woman with nine brothers had better have his facts in better shape than John Ashcroft. <laughs> how he ultimately succeeded in having an extensive interview of Bush and Cheney by the full commission, and how we were able to overcome White House objections to Condoleezza Rice giving sworn testimony in open hearings. I discuss our interview of President Bush and Vice President Cheney, and especially the President's response to questions as to why the United States did not retaliate against the Taliban for harboring al-Qaeda once al-Qaeda's responsibility for the attack against the USS Cole was established. And perhaps I'll conclude the reading from the text um, with this. After I had uh, uh, questioned President Bush uh, about this topic, and I would emphasize that the, the interviews were very cordial. President Bush could not have been uh, nicer. He responded to all of our questions. He told us what he knew and what he didn't know. He did not know that President Clinton, uh, on three occasions, had sent the emissaries to the Taliban warning them that if, if al-Qaeda had attacked us, we had, after all, uh, demanded that the Taliban expel al-Qaeda from their sanctuary in Afghanistan. If al-Qaeda had, had struck against us, that we would retaliate against the Taliban. What were the odds that a retaliatory attack against the Taliban would have changed the course of the 9-11 attack, which was already in its late stages of planning? Pure speculation. Might Mullah Omar and the surviving Taliban leadership just as easily become more entrenched in their support of al-Qaeda and their hatred of the United States? Who knew? President Bush shook me out of my thoughts. Richard, you know more about the evidence in the coal than I do. You knew more about the Yemenis. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever lost an argument? Mr. President, I also have two daughters. <laughs> and finally, uh, I talk about how the commission staff uncovered the truth, disproving the Air Force's claim that it was poised to shoot down United Flight 93 as had it approached Washington, when in fact NORAD was unaware that 93 had even been hijacked until after it crashed in a Shanksville, Pennsylvania field. And yet uh, the Air Force had published a glossy book uh, describing how it was poised to shoot down 93. September 11 was marked by great heroism, demonstrated by America's best. On the other hand, our investigation also yielded 
a record of failures to take advantage of Al-Qaeda's mistakes, failures to share information, to follow up on leads in a timely fashion, and demonstrate leadership to act proactively on the information in the collective possession of our law enforcement and intelligence agencies. This was perhaps best cap uh, capsulized in FAA official Ben Sliney's answer to a question I asked him at the commission's final public hearing as to what information in the possession of our law enforcement and intelligence agencies he would have most wanted to know pre-9-11, which he did not know on that date. And this was in the context of the failure to disseminate information about the training uh, of young uh, Muslim men from uh, foreign countries uh, in US facilities learning to fly commercial aircraft, and most particularly, the arrest of Zacharias Musawi only weeks before 9-11, trying to learn to maneuver a jumbo jet, uh, which he had absolutely no credible explanation for. According to Slaney, the most significant fact he would have liked to know, and that no one had ever suggested to him, was that the hijackers could fly the plane. What I have tried to capture through these five episodes in the book are that people matter. Ours is a government of laws and individuals. Our democracy is not self-executing. Accountability is not preordained. People like Bob Morgenthau, Mike Seymour, Archibald Cox, Leon Jaworski, Paul Sarbanes, Tom Kane, Lee Hamilton and others portrayed in the book certainly have made a difference in the outcome of the events with which they were involved. I believe that transparency and the people's right to know are important ingredients in the recipe for a functioning democracy. I hope that the portraits I describe in my memoir will add some flavor to the soup of future discussions, and I thank you very much. Richard, I'd like to start the conversation by going back to Watergate and asking you uh, if you would tell us about what I think is one of the fascinating stories, and that is from the moment that you all discovered the existence of the secretly made tapes of President Nixon talking with his aides. How did you move from that point to getting President Nixon to turn over the tapes, which he must have known would result in, in his being uh, leaving office one way or another? Well, George, the... Uh the process was quite interesting, and it involved all three branches of government. Uh, as you know, um, the existence of the tapes was revealed through the questioning of the Senate Select Committee staff of Alexander Butterfield, one of the very few people in the Nixon White House who knew of the existence of the system. Dean had been suspicious that he was being taped, um, and the staff, the Senate staff, uh, questioned uh, whether, uh, as a routine basis, everybody who came through, uh, whether they knew of any taping system. Butterfield was not going to lie, and he revealed the system. Uh, we then uh, utilized uh, sort of all the sources we had to identify uh, the meetings which we thought would have discussed Watergate uh, and the break-in, and we issued a subpoena. And we argued before Judge Sirica. Judge Sirica uh, granted our motion to our subpoena uh, to turn over the tapes. And uh, this was um, affirmed by the, the uh, uh, appellate court, the uh, Court of Appeals for the DC Circuit. Uh, Nixon was defiant. Cox explained that 
his obligation was to gather evidence. There was no way that he could accept anything less uh, than the actual tape recordings as evidence, and uh, he proceeded uh, to demand them. Uh, Nixon determined uh, that he would fire Cox. He first asked his attorney general, Elliot Richardson, to fire Cox. Uh, he refused in the so-called Saturday Night Massacre and uh, resigned. Uh, Ruckel's house, who was the deputy, uh, refused the order uh, from uh, Nixon's chief of staff, Alexander Haig, to fire Cox. Uh, Ruckel's house was fired. Uh, and finally, the Solicitor General, Robert Bork, uh, agreed to uh, convey the order firing Archibald Cox. And so it was only after the uh, tremendous uh, response of the American public to what had happened, they uh, overwhelmed the then uh, available means of communication in, to Washington uh, by uh, telegrams. Western Union could not keep up with the flow of telegrams. The, the switchboards in Congress and at the White House were overwhelmed uh, with protests that ran uh, nine to one, uh, uh, criticizing the president's action. Finally, the president reversed course and uh, announced that he would uh, indeed turn over the subpoena tapes. But weren't there some conversations uh, between your office uh, and the White House about what uh, might be in the indictment and what might be on the tapes that, that you had to sort of gently let them know about? Well, that came later uh, in the process. Um, indeed, uh, they knew what was on the tapes because they turned them over to us. Uh, but later on, uh, we had uh, asked the grand jury to authorize us to name at a later date all of the unindicted co-conspirators. And among the unindicted co-conspirators who were named were Richard Nixon uh, by reason of the evidence, much of which coming from his own mouth, uh, that uh, showed that he had joined the conspiracy to obstruct justice and indeed had directed, among other things, uh, his uh, chief domestic uh, advisor, John Ehrlichman, to convey to uh, the deputy director of CIA that he should go to the FBI and tell them falsely that their investigation was trampling CIA operations. Well, uh, the existence of the naming and the vote uh, by the grand jury to name Richard Nixon as an unindicted co-conspirator was a secret, a secret which did not leak. Indeed, nothing leaked from our office. Uh, and we were sitting on the most explosive information, the contents of the tape, and of course, this vote. And so in the course of arguing about a uh, second subpoena, a trial subpoena for additional tapes, uh, the White House uh, through its counsel, took the position that there was no need for us to uh, get additional tapes since they couldn't be admissible in court because they would be hearsay. Tapes would only be admissible if all the participants in the conversations were conspirators. We then showed the counsel to the president the vote by the grand jury. Uh, which came as a stunning surprise to him that we had kept that information uh, appropriately secret until the time that it would be uh, needed by the courts to determine this issue. And I think that was uh, an interesting day. Regarding the case of Whitewater, uh, I believe you said that the evidence was insubstantial concerning the any wrongdoing on the part of the Clintons. And, uh, and it seems that other reports recently uh, suggest that's the answer. However, for so long a period, uh, the, uh, the question seemed to be up in the air. And uh, many of the public, I imagine, even today, would believe that uh, it's inconclusive and perhaps there was wrongdoing. And how would such a story get legs to such a long time, for such a long time, when it seems that the evidence is not there? 
Well, I think that's partly a function of the conflation between news and entertainment. And as I say, um, a scandal sells. Um, pretty much the same as uh, if it bleeds, it leads in the local newscast. Um, that's what we've come to, getting attention. And the complexity of the financial dealings of the Clintons and uh, some of their uh, lack of uh, being forthcoming themselves in terms of the early explanations of this fed the scandal machine. And clearly, um, the right wing uh, media uh, had a field day back and forth, back and forth, uh, continuing to keep that story alive. And so uh, it persisted. And then there was, uh, uh, of course, the majority in the Senate, uh, which was able to then choose uh, uh, the members uh, on the Republican side of a committee to conduct the investigation, and then uh, which kept it alive still longer. And each day we would get up and knock down the day's uh, uh, preordained uh, testimony that would be so damaging to the president. And then when it turned out to be inconclusive, there was rarely a press report that showed what the actual evidence uh, taken in public revealed. They just went on to the next assertion that was floated uh, by the right wing. And that's my take on what kept Whitewater alive for so long. Um, as an interested and observant citizen, I think my biggest frustration has become uh, the inability of politicians and public officials to speak transparently and honestly to the American people. Uh, I'd like your assessment of whether this has improved or not uh, under the new administration. I think it's a bit early to uh, make a final determination on that, sir. Uh, uh, I think. Uh, President Obama has made statements about transparency and accountability that are laudable. Um, we need to see, as citizens, uh, paying attention to what happens, uh, whether those uh, laudatory comments are backed up by fact. And uh, I share your view, and in fact, that's uh, perhaps the primary theme of this book. I'm curious uh, to hear your comments and thoughts about how do you balance the giving out of information in relation to the right of the people to know versus divulging too much information that could compromise us in relation to people who want to do ill will? I think that's an excellent question. And uh, part of the great difficulty um, that we have in finding the right balance over the years. What strikes me, having been involved in uh, declassification projects, either de facto or actually I was appointed by President Clinton uh, as a one of three members, uh, public members, to a commission to declassify uh, still secret documents relating to uh, US holdings. Uh, going back to World War II in the post-war period about uh, uh, hiring of Nazis and supporting uh, those who hired former Nazis uh, as part of the intelligence apparatus uh, in Western Europe. And uh, my conclusions are that there is a huge, huge amount of overclassification. And unless there is leadership from the very top to reassess the way in which the classification process occurs, there will be no change. Um, certainly, there is an absolute need to protect that which is vital to our national security and which information might benefit those who mean to do us harm. I don't minimize that. But there is so much overclassification, it leads me to conclude 
that it's simply easier to use the secret uh, stamp or top secret stamp to uh, protect the uh, individual who uses that stamp against some later ramification should he be wrong or she be wrong, um, and to cover up uh, incompetence, which is often the motivator for classifying information uh, as far as I have found through my own personal observations on this matter. And so, again, President Obama has made clear his intention to change the process. Uh, I will note here in this fabulous room uh, the quote attributed uh, to Thomas Jefferson, the price of democracy is eternal vigilance. We all need to be vigilant to determine uh, whether those in positions of authority are fulfilling their responsibilities. Thank you. Uh, back to Watergate. Last night on MSNBC, you can tell where I'm coming from, John Dean was interviewed concerning the revision of his book. And in that interview, he claimed that he had no evidence that Nixon had ordered the break-in, but that Nixon had let it be known to those around him that he was interested in certain kinds of financial information, which implicitly could only be obtained through the DNC. Do you have any comments on that? Well, I think that's a plausible explanation for what the burglars were looking for. Again, as I note, uh, Nixon was always interested in any information that could damage his adversaries. And so there was a competition and a desire on the part of those uh, who, Nick, uh, who Nixon surrounded himself with uh, to be the one to bring the mouse to uh, the master's feet. Uh, as far as whether it, this, such information could only be gleaned uh, by a break in of the DNC headquarters, um, I could be a little bit uh, skeptical about that, but uh, clearly that could be a place where such information resided. I think Dean's thesis is that uh, there was some hint of uh, a kickback uh, scheme whereby uh, individuals who were uh, uh, in charge of running the upcoming Democratic Convention to be held in Miami Beach uh, were allegedly obtaining kickbacks from certain providers of services. And uh, uh, I don't think, uh, certainly we didn't see anything on the then existing tapes that would have corroborated that, but uh, there may be such uh, on recently uh, revealed tape recordings uh, of which there is a plethora none of which seems to uh, be in any way uh, mitigating President Nixon's misconduct in this area. Well, it's wonderful to get an insider's look at this. And going back to the title of your book, The Emperor's New Clothes, as members of the public, uh, what do you suggest we do to open our eyes to uh, be you know, sensitive to the kind of hypocrisy you've talked about? Well, I think you need to measure uh, words against actions, and it's not an easy process. You know, these are professional spinmeisters who are employed uh, by uh, uh, political organizations, candidates. Uh, it is very popular uh, to simply make uh, broadside attacks, one against the other. Late night television uh, is rife with it. It's extremely unfortunate. <laughs> Uh, but the obligation of an informed citizenry is to cut through uh, all of the hyperbole and to understand and get to the actual crux of the matter with uh, facts that are available. And this is extremely difficult in view of the fact that newspapers are in such decline and the uh, resources available to investigative reporters and talented editors has been so reduced. So our job as citizens is all the more difficult. And that's why in a great university we teach students to think for themselves, to think critically, and hopefully um, 
this will be passed on generation and generation, and we will somehow shed ourselves uh, of the present uh, toxic environment in which uh, such overblown claims uh, tend to overshadow uh, what's really at issue. I had a question regarding the 9-11 work that you did. Um, it's my understanding that the general concept of using a commercial airliner as a weapon um, predated 9-11 by a substantial amount of time. And that other countries, uh, specifically Israel, uh, were alerted to this um, potential problem and took security measures to prevent it, uh, one of which was to secure the cockpit area of their commercial airliners and arm their crews. And that this <clears throat> precautionary measure uh, within our own commercial airline industry was rejected for a number of reasons. Um, uh, could you shed any light on this um, uh, eventuality? Can. Yes, and, and thank you for your comments. The 9-11 uh, the Commission's final report uh, deals with this in some detail. In our open hearings, uh, we showed that the intelligence agencies of the United States were aware of the potential for <laughs> Uh, airline, suicide airline hijackings uh, to involve uh, crashing planes into iconic buildings. Um, there were at least a dozen uh, such which we revealed publicly in our hearing. So the notion that no one could have anticipated, which was the first reaction from the White House, uh, was proved incorrect. Uh, uh, our intelligence agencies uh, it did, in fact, uh, consider this possibility. In fact, um, uh, on the drawing board uh, for uh, uh, use in 2002, uh, but fully, <coughs> fully planned and fully baked at that point, was an exercise called Amalgam Virgo II, if I'm getting it correct. Um, which, were, which hypothesized multiple hijackings by terrorists crashing, building, crashing their planes into buildings. Hello. Um, I have two questions for you about Watergate. First of all, before you got the tapes, um, what role did the Washington Post articles play in your investigation? And also, after you got the tapes, those 18 and a half minutes that were erased, what was your initial reaction to those? And did you do anything to try to find out what was on those tapes, and if so, what did you do and what did you find? Excellent question. <laughs> Let me try to remember all the pieces. I, as, um, as I said earlier, um, uh, all the branches of government were involved, and I, I, I guess I didn't mention the fourth estate, um, uh, the press, uh, which played a vital role uh, initially in uncovering uh, the depth and breadth uh, of the Watergate break-in, which, as many of you will recall, was dismissed by the White House spin machine as a third-rate burglary uh, by people acting basically on their own bunch of kooks. Um, Woodward and Bernstein were uh, critically involved in investigating that, and uh, as those who are familiar with the process of how newspaper articles see the light of day and are published. It requires editors and a publisher uh, who's willing to uh, take the risk and the ramifications. And believe me, there were threats made by the White House against the, White House, against the Washington Post um, uh, so that they are willing to publish the results of the investigative reporting. So uh, Woodward and Bernstein were very important. Um, once I heard about the uh, 18 and a half minute gap, I was incredulous because at this point we had already received the uh, cancer on the presidency speech, which was tremendously incriminating of the president and his closest advisors in connection with their knowledge of and their participation 
in a conspiracy to obstruct justice. So what in the world could have been on this tape, uh, which was a conversation only three days after the break-in, where uh, the president and his aides had reassembled in, in Washington. Uh, I think the president had been in California at the time and his other aides in Florida, but they were all together this first meeting. And so we know from the notes of H.R. Haldeman that the conversation that was erased was one in which Watergate was discussed. So the actual information that was erased uh, could not be uh, reconstituted by the experts who have looked at, uh, initially looked at uh, those recordings and examined them, and uh, over the decades, uh, the efforts which have been made to uh, somehow reconstitute those recordings. Uh, my own view is that there perhaps was a recognition that information which had been transmitted uh, by those who were providing summaries of what was on those tapes uh, to H.R. Haldeman's uh, chief aide uh, somehow found their way to the president. It seemed a stretch to think that Haldeman, having access to this information through his own uh, administrative assistant, would somehow keep that information from the president's ears. And perhaps there was something along the lines of a bunch of idiots. How could they? Uh, they didn't get anything, and now uh, look at all the trouble we're causing. Some statement like that, uh, recognizing the president's familiarity with what had come out uh, of the Watergate uh, eavesdropping caper, uh, would have been tremendously damaging to the president. And perhaps that motivated the erasure. The erasure, which uh, was investigated by a bipartisan uh, uh, panel of experts chosen by the White House and our special prosecutor's office, concluded that the erasures were the uh, uh, conclusion of uh, at least five and perhaps as many as nine deliberate separate erasures. Richard Benveniste has been at the heart of several of the uh, most important developments in our political history over the last half century. Uh, he's not only been an observer with an unusual access, but he's been a uh, powerful uh, participant in the resolution of many of these uh, crises that have confronted our country. Uh, his book is called The Emperor's New Clothes, Exposing the Truth from Watergate to 9-11. Thank you very much, Richard.